in relation to Google advertising or any kind of advertising, in fact, are you mustn't engage in conduct that is likely to mislead or deceive. Mm -hmm. And you must not make false or misleading claims or statements. Welcome back to the Teach Traffic podcast with myself, Ilana Wexler. This is a show where we reveal the best tips, tricks, and tactics to increasing your website traffic and then converting that traffic into leads and sales. We also discuss what's working right now in the ever-changing world of web marketing so you can apply it to your business. Welcome back to another episode of Teach Traffic. I am your host, Alana Wexler, and in today's episode... We've got a really interesting topic that we're going to talk about. Uh, We're going to talk about the legal aspects of social media marketing, be it search engine marketing or social media marketing. And I guess really we're going to cover the basics of the legal aspects of it. And I find this is really not talked about very often. And so, you know, many people say, oh, you just throw up an ad and, and people will enter your ecosystem that way. But in fact, if you do it the wrong way, there can be many legal consequences uh, for doing things the wrong way. So I am by no means a legal expert. So I have invited a very special guest who is, in fact, a lawyer and who is, in fact, an expert in the legalities around what you can and you can't say in your advertising. So welcome to today's episode, Bridget Ruberstein from Le- Level Up Legal. Hi, Lana. Thanks so much for inviting me to join your show Um, advertising compliance is something that most people don't find extremely exciting. Exactly. (laughs) um, I work with a lot of clients who have come to us to get their ads reviewed regularly after facing significant penalties or court action by their competitors. And there are significant penalties attached to getting it wrong. So it's really, really important to get on top of your marketing compliance. Awesome. And that's really what we want to talk about today. And I kind of want to go through like the basics for somebody who really doesn't know anything about it. And sort of what are the basics that need to know, um, you know, to sort of get up to speed to some to some degree. And also we're going to cover people who kind of do know the basics and what are some also other areas that they need to be aware of before we do get stuck into uh, the, sort of the nitty gritty about that. Do you want to give us a little bit of uh, background about the type of work um, that you do in, in your in your business so we can kind of get some context? Yeah, absolutely. So I recently, I was involved in corporate law for over 20 years as an intellectual property lawyer. Um, and then about three months ago, um, a colleague and I started our own boutique intellectual property and consumer law agency Um, We specialize in intellectual property, branding, advertising, and we also have developed a product called Adder. And what we do is we review marketing collateral for small or large companies in highly regulated environments to ensure that they comply with the Australian consumer law or other relevant self-regulatory codes um, or legislation. And uh, so I work a lot with marketing teams Mm -hmm. in trying to create um, compliant collateral that's also creative and engaging you know you don't want to be that lawyer that uh, you know kind of destroys the creative process we understand that the marketing objective is to sell and so we try and help people to do that in a way that is legally compliant but also still effective from a marketing yes. perspective well that's 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 fantastic because it's really really important and it's like one of those situations that we you know it, we've had battles in the past where you know you want to say something in your ad copy because it's persuasive and it's compelling but then the legal department steps in and says, no nope, sorry you can't say that absolutely that's so, the challenge <laughs> exactly and that's a real fine balance so perhaps we can just get started um into why this is important, um, you know, before we kind of get through the the what and the how, why, why is this really important for people to pay attention to the legalities around what you can and can't say? Yeah, so I think there's four sort of core reasons why people want to really pay attention to legal compliance. I think the first is that um, consumer trust is the cornerstone of a brand success at the moment. And you can seriously damage your brand's integrity 
if you um, are found to be misleading consumers. It's obviously um, very damaging to a brand's integrity. Another thing that compliance assists with is, is achieving and maintaining brand consistency and having a consistent messaging throughout your marketing. Um, I think it's a competitive advantage, marketing compliance. And lastly, what we obviously focus on is the significant legal consequences. Um, and I think that, you know, those consequences people don't know, it's not only civil penalties, which can be in tens of millions of dollars for corporations um, or $500,000 and up for individuals, but there are also civil and criminal penalties for um, breaches of the Corporations Act or the Australian Consumer Law. And we can discuss a few of those um, in due course, but actually recently there's been a few cases where the regulators have actually taken criminal action against companies for misleading and deceptive advertising practices, particularly wow. in the financial services industry. Wow. Well, that certainly does sound sufficiently scary to me, and I'm sure <laughs> many of our listeners uh, feel sufficiently scared as well. So why don't we go through um, some of the basics about what uh, business owners or agency owners would need to know. And what I mean by that is like, what are the basics of what you can and you can't say in, let's say your, your Google ads. So those, maybe those text ads that you're running on googlesearch.com, uh, what, you know, how do you know what you can and can't say? Yeah. So I think the core obligations um, in relation to Google advertising or any kind of advertising, in fact, are, you mustn't engage in conduct that is likely to mislead or deceive mm -hmm. and you must not make false or misleading claims or statements. And those are sort of the, the golden truths and your starting point for everything. Um, and some basic guidelines when you're asking yourself, how do I make sure that my advertising is not likely to mislead or deceive or doesn't contain false or misleading claims. And we always tell our clients that the starting point is to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer mm -hmm. and ask yourself what is the overall impression that's created by this advertisement um, so it's not so much about reading line by line and seeing whether literally it can be supported you have to look at it as a reasonable consumer would and say is this ad misleading um, and so for example what people often don't understand is that a statement can be true but also be misleading. So if you put in a half truth or an omission, that can be both true and misleading. I can give you a, an example if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Um, so let's just say that I sell a 50 gram jar of honey for $50 mm -hmm. and my competitor next door sells a hundred gram um, jar of honey for a hundred dollars. It would be accurate and truthful for me to say that I sell my honey at half the price of my competitor but it would be misleading because mm. his is double the size. Mm. Um, another thing that a lot of clients fall down on is an understanding of disclaimers. Um, a disclaimer is something that you can use to qualify a statement or to perhaps explain some of the further details, but you can never use a disclaimer to correct a misleading statement um okay if that makes sense mm -hmm. the you can't basically hide it in the fine print another thing to remember is that with google ads there is no disclaimer generally mm. um so you've got to make sure that the ad as it stands in its complete form is not misleading before you have to click through to the next page right so you can't sort of have certain ad copy in, in the Google ad, for example, but then have the disclaimers and all the qualifiers on the landing page, for example. You would do that and you right. can do that, but you those disclaimers and qualifiers that are on the next page can't contradict what's stated in the main body. Got so it. a good example would be you can always say terms and conditions apply Right. And all your terms and conditions and all of those can be a click away. Okay. But if you were to say something along the lines of um, everybody gets a free pair of shoes when they buy with us today, 
you couldn't then on the one click away page say only if you spend a hundred dollars or more right because it's then misleading people on the main ad got it okay yeah what about if you're in the weight loss industry let's say which is obviously a massive industry where people really want to entice people with some court sort of guarantee that they will lose x amount of weight in a certain amount of time what about an industry like that or or, or fitness really you know I think that's you've got to be pretty careful in those industries not to over promise Mm. Um, essentially you cannot make any claim that you cannot substantiate and prove with evidence Mm -hmm. so puffery is okay in the sense that you could say you'll feel better than you have in years because that's a bit of a vague statement but if you're going to make a statement that says lose 10 kilograms in two weeks Mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that the average reasonable person is going to lose 10 kilograms in two weeks um, on your product and that you can substantiate that with evidence okay is there somewhere on like, let's say somebody's listening to this episode and they you know they're still sort of unsure about um you know what they can and can't say in terms of it's maybe it's a bit sort of vague for their industry and there's so many weird and wonderful industries out there that we all know um is there somewhere that they can check their ad copy to see if it is okay you know i mean generally most people want to do the right thing and so often mistakes are made inadvertently so there actually are a, a lot of great resources available online that um, help you break down your obligations in terms of the Australian consumer law. Um, the AANA um, also has some great free courses and other um, interesting resources that will help you get on top of it. And of course, we offer, if you're producing a high impact campaign, we offer an advertising review service where we will, within a 24 hour turnaround time, can review an urgent campaign and just um, help you work on areas of concern and come up with something compliant. But um, there are definitely a number of online resources that are valuable. And Mm -hmm. uh, Ilana, will you put those? Yeah, I can put a link in the show notes to that uh, AANA, did you say it was, uh, government website. And obviously that's the the DIY option or um, that's obviously an area of service that that you offer for your clients. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So um, what about a a really, really common question that I, I get asked is as an advertiser, can I bid on my competitor's name as a keyword? And then we're going to get to later. You can use it in the ad copy, but there's there's two parts to this. The first part is let's say, um, you know, someone's in the, in the weight loss space and they want to bid on the keyword weight watchers, for example, can they do that? Are they going to get in trouble? Yeah. So I get this question a a lot as well. Um, Obviously, if you bid on your competitor's trademark, registered trademark, um, what will happen is you can potentially rank above them in sponsored ads. Mm -hmm. Is that true, Ilana? Sorry. Absolutely, it's true. And sorry, I was just going to say, like one one case study I always seem to use in presentations, and this is, I I find it only happens in Australia, it doesn't happen in America, but, you know, we all know that the, online pizza companies are at war with each other, Pizza Hut and Domino's. And if I, if I do often a search for, for Pizza Hut on, on Google, I'll see Domino's Pizza is, is, is advertising. And not only are they advertising, they're offering a 30% discount. Nice. So, um, yeah, I, I guess can Domino's Pizza get in trouble for that? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously um, their competitors aren't going to like it. But, um, and there has been a couple of lawsuits around it because obviously the competitors raised that it was trademark infringement. You're using my registered trademark to advertise your goods. Mm. Um, And so there has been a couple of cases around that. And our courts have actually found that 
because the keyword is not visible to consumers, mm. they have found that that isn't trademark infringement. Um, you've got to use your, you've got to use the word as a trademark to infringe someone else's registered mark. Okay. Um, and if no one can see it, the courts have found that that's not trademark use. So as long as it's yeah. invisible, you can bid on your competitor's registered trademark. Got it. And that sort of leads into the second part of the question of can you use their registered trademark or brand name in the ad copy? And my guess would be no. Well, your guess is partially right. Okay. Partially wrong. So, again, um, to explain what trademark use is, it's when you use a registered trademark as a signifier of your goods or services. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you an example of how you can use your competitor's trademark in your, in your ad, in your sponsored ad copy and how you can't. Okay. So to stick with um, fast food, let's go with Nando's and Red Rooster. So Red Rooster um, purchases Nando's as a key, I mean, it bids on Nando's as a keyword and also in its advertising, as you search for Nando's, the first thing you see is a big Nando sign. And then you click on Nando's and you get taken through to Red Rooster's Chicken. Yep. That would be trademark infringing um, and definitely would land them in hot water. But if they were to use the Nando's trademark as a keyword, when you open the ad, if it said, are you sick and tired of Nando's? Come to Red Rooster. That would actually be okay. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be infringing. So I think the test is, are customers going to be confused as to who's actually selling the chicken? Yeah. Then the first example, they're going to think they're going through to a Nando's website and they're going to be confused when they arrive at Red Rooster. They may think, are Nando's now affiliated with Red Rooster? Have they purchased Red Rooster? So if there's any customer confusion along those lines, Got that's it. a good indicator that it's likely to be problematic. Got it. In the second example, they're being really cheeky, Red Rooster, but they're not infringing Nando's trademark mm -hmm. because they're not using it to indicate that that's the source of their chicken, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And in fact, I... Uh had a client in a super competitive space of the, um, you know, I guess home, home delivered meals type thing, yeah. but, you know, think, think like a competitor to you foods. Uh, okay. Most of our Australian uh, listeners will be aware of you foods. And um, I saw a very, very cheeky ad by a competitor to you foods where they were saying they some, because of the, the name of the business it's you and food, they somehow incorporated that in their ad copy, but in a, I think in a very misleading and deceptive way. And I just wonder if uh, if that got them in hot water. I don't remember in the exact ad copy, yeah. but they they used you and food together, obviously with a space between it, but they were bidding on the brand you foods. Yes. And, so yeah. that happens all the time. Um, and it often can be quite a fine line. We've spoken about trademark infringement, but actually there's also what we haven't discussed and, and should mention is you can't breach the Australian consumer law on those ads either. So if you use the trademark in a way that's confusing to consumers, but not trademark infringement, it may still be misleading and deceptive conduct in terms of the Australian consumer law. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's even a more significant risk because if there's trademark infringement, you know, you have a fight with a competitor, you can potentially take the advertising down urgently mm. um, and try and resolve the matter. But if you infringe the Australian consumer law, then you face penalties, you know, if you're a corporation of up to $10 million per offense. Wow. So you've got to be careful. And in fact, there's just been a case now where EmploySure, um, structured their entire sponsored Google advertising around fair work mm -hmm. um, so that everyone thought that they were actually affiliated. They didn't even put the employee sure website wow. all the way through, you know, the whole customer journey, they wow. would enter fair, fair work. This ad would come up. They wouldn't see employee sure. They would see more fair trade click through. 
think they're going through to a government website and even get the advice thinking that it's um, you know a government body but it was actually a private body employee show so wow. they were found to be misleading and deceptive uh, and paid a substantial penalty wow well I mean that sounds like fair enough like they were <laughs> definitely doing the wrong thing knowingly Absolutely. and yeah. another way that people try and and use trademarks which is perfectly legitimate is that if someone has got a descriptive name as a trademark um let's say for example teach traffic is your name mm -hmm. um and you register a trademark which i hope you have done ilana bridget you're <laughs> helping me with that I would... <laughs> Um, so once you've registered your trademark, you can prevent anyone else from using that brand name. Uh -huh. But if somebody wanted to say, a competitor wanted to take an ad and write, come to us and we'll help you teach traffic or we'll teach you traffic, okay. they would be able to do that on the basis that they're simply describing their services uh -huh. as opposed to using the trademark um, as a badge of origin or as a sort of indicator of the source of the services, if that makes sense. Yeah, got it. And there's a lot of that because I think Google responds really well to names, like especially I've seen it, for example, in the appliance industries or the plumbers. You've got people that are named Sydney plumbers or Sydney's yes. largest plumbers or West Sydney plumbers. And so then it gets really, really complicated because often they do have registered trademarks because they've been trading for 20 years. They've built up the reputation, but everyone's using it in their Google ads um, and gets away with it on the basis that it's descriptive yeah. um, of what they do. And it, I think it is confusing for consumers. Yeah, interesting. That kind of leads me actually into my next question, which is, let's say, you know, let's just take my business for example because we, we used it and somebody is using teach traffic somewhere in the ad copy what would some what's the next step for somebody like me to do where I realize this is going on or some mm -hmm. one of our listeners sees one of their competitors kind of really overstepping the line in in terms of using their brand what do they then do like how do they how do they then approach someone so our view is always that you start off with an intellectual property protection policy. Don't wait until that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so have a clear policy in place. We always advise our clients not to send their own letter mm -hmm. to the other side. And there's a number of reasons for that, which I can talk you through briefly. Sure. But to get lawyers to send a cease and desist letter immediately right. and as soon as possible. Um, the reason why you don't want to be sending that letter on your own, and I often see that it happens, people sort of name and shame on Instagram and things like that. Yeah. The first thing is that in terms of the Trademarks Act, it's actually you're prohibited from making unjustified threats of trademark infringement. So it may look like trademark infringement to you, but in the example that you and I discussed, Ilana, where it may be someone's incorporated your mark into the mm -hmm. copy, it may not be trademark infringement. And you then could potentially be liable for damages if you accuse them of trademark infringement. Wow. And it's not. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that you want to be really clear and accurate in terms of what it is you're saying the person is doing mm -hmm. and what you expect from them to do, because that's really your... Um, foundation of any further legal action that you take so in general what we would do is we would send a cease and desist letter which would explain exactly what it is that they're doing that's unlawful and setting out our requirements um, for compliance so removing the ad um, generally we take a commercial approach in the sense that if you haven't suffered damages go for a commercial solution Mm -hmm. which is really to just get the person to stop using your trademark as soon as possible. Mm. Um, and we also have a view that you shouldn't really um, allow, you know, you see someone that's potentially a, not really a big competitor. Don't let that slip under the rugs because if you don't sort of zealously protect your intellectual property, especially if you're online, yeah. it can really get out of hand mm. quickly. 
Mm. Let's say some, one of our listeners um, is listening to this and that's happened to them, but they haven't registered their brand, like they're not trademarked. Do they have any leg to stand on then? Yeah, they definitely do. So a registered trademark is really helpful in the sense that as soon as it's registered, there's a law which you can rely on which says, I own this, you're not allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you haven't got a registered trademark, you can still argue that um, you've built up a substantial reputation or goodwill mm -hmm. in your unregistered trademark, in your name, and that um, mm -hmm. people are potentially confusing consumers by using a similar name to relate to their goods. So that would be misleading and deceptive conduct in terms of the Australian consumer law. Mm -hmm. um, and also potentially passing off. Um, and what that really means is that someone can't, you know, let's say you spent years and significant resources building up a brand. Mm -hmm. Someone is not allowed to kind of hop onto that, onto your rep, ride on your reputation by using a similar brand um, to get business. Even if they haven't registered a trademark, which Even they should, they by the way, and they should use your services. Yes. yes, but often, you know, it's the kind of situation and I know I found myself in this situation where, you know, you start a business and you don't really know how it's going to go and suddenly the months turn into years and before you know it, you've been running for years and yep. and then, yeah, like you've built up this reputation along the way and you just, it's something you kind of haven't got around to doing. It's just interesting to know if if that's your situ one situation, do they have actually a leg to stand on if they hadn't kind of set up the foundations earlier? Yeah, they definitely do. Uh, it's different in the sense that you have to actually provide quite a bit of evidence of your reputation, of how you've used the mark over the years. You've got to show that there's a likelihood of customer confusion. Um, so it is definitely more onerous than, trademark, than a trademark infringement claim. Mm -hmm. But certainly you do have rights and all those years under your belt will benefit mm -hmm. you even in a trademark application. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Is there anything else uh, that people need to be aware of if they're sort of running, you know, Google ads and they're in yeah, a, yeah. a competitive space with lots of people who've got trademark? It's not, it's not entirely related to Google advertising, but I think it's interesting um, from an SEO perspective and, and what we were talking about with using competitors registered trademarks, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, although you can use your competitors registered trademark as a keyword, mm -hmm. you can't actually use it as a meta tag, funnily enough, in your website. Okay, interesting. Um, and the courts, that's um, based on a court decision the court found that if you know where to look, you know how to read the coding of someone's website and therefore that trademark is potentially viewable to consumers and may constitute trademark infringement. Interesting. So that was quite an interesting judgment. Hmm. I guess it's a uh, evolving space as yeah, it definitely is. as the web evolves and um, people are just sort of really still navigating this this landscape what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make in in writing their ads and obviously with the with the lens of how people can avoid making some of the classic yeah. mistakes not necessarily in writing their ads but certainly one of the areas where i see the most um confusion and potential infringement is around reviews mm -hmm. getting google reviews or getting facebook reviews um i think people misunderstand how seriously the ACCC, which is the regulator takes um misleading reviews or or how seriously they consider it mm -hmm. so for example a lot of people don't understand can i give incentives for reviews can i say to people um, you can have a free night's accommodation at a hotel if you write us a positive review that's a good example yes um, of what you can't do so yes you can offer an incentive but you've got to offer the incentive to all customers those that are likely to be happy or unhappy um, and you've got to invite them to review honestly 
So right. the, the, the incentive shouldn't be linked in any way to a positive review. Got it. Um, so an example of something you could do is you could say, please um, give us an honest review of your stay at our hotel and enjoy a free cocktail when you leave. That would be totally um, acceptable. Um, but I see a lot of people, especially small businesses, they will say things like, please, will you write us a positive review? We're a new business. We really need the love. Mm. That is a no-no. <laughs> um, and if somebody does that, what, what are the consequences of that? Yeah, so basically as the business owner, it's your responsibility to have that removed. Right. Um, so A, don't solicit it. And B, if someone does it, even though you haven't incentivized it, like a well-meaning friend, which actually happened to our law firm, we said, you know, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, but please remove the review. Um, it has to be authentic and genuine. And they have and to have think, used their, your product or service, I would imagine. Absolutely. That, absolutely. Yeah. And if you incentivize people to provide reviews, we always suggest that you disclose it. So just put mm -hmm. a small line of copy that says our customers were rewarded with free cocktails for providing honest feedback on their mm. experience. Mm. Um, a lot of questions we get are around how do we deal with negative reviews mm. and we remove them. Exactly. This is like a whole nother world opening up, isn't it? With it, it really is. And I mean, reviews are really valuable currency for, for most small businesses nowadays. So yeah. it's a tricky area. Um, so with negative reviews, if somebody does write a really negative um, review of your goods or services, I think that you can respond to it and mm -hmm. um, potentially try and manage it in that way, but you absolutely cannot remove it. Interesting. The only basis that you can remove a negative review is if it is potentially misleading and this would apply to a negative or positive right. review. So, for example, if you make burgers, 100% beef burgers, mm -hmm. and somebody says on your um, Facebook page, these were the worst vegan burgers I've ever eaten, <laughs> you do get to remove that because it's misleading consumers that the burgers are vegan when they're not. Okay. But if they said these are the worst burgers? You just can't. have to cop it and you know obviously we always say reply professionally um and and try and mitigate the damage in that way mm -hmm. but i don't know if you remember the the there was a bit of a out cry around the meritons review rating manipulations a couple of years ago i don't know if you remember no. that no i don't but what meriton was doing which was really very sneaky is they had engaged TripAdvisor um, to collate and collect all email addresses of guests and then, you know, display their review and rating, which is a powerful way that consumers use TripAdvisor to find hotels. Yes. What they did very sneakily is that if they had a period where customers were unlikely to be happy because there were renovations going on at the hotel, et cetera. Right. They would literally change a letter or two in those customers' email addresses so that basically TripAdvisor would get all the correct email addresses for those customers that had a good time oh and God. were likely to have enjoyed their stay and then obviously couldn't contact anybody that was likely not to have enjoyed their stay because their email addresses were all um, edited. And they got found out. And apart from paying substantial penalties, um, I think it was extremely damaging to their reputation. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed that they managed to find that out. How would they have? Um, they must have had a um, somebody on the inside. Possibly an unhappy employee. A disgruntled employee. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it normally happens. <laughs> yeah. Wow. God, that's crazy. I mean, we all know reviews are just so powerful you know in the world of social media where it's you know the treasure trove is the comment section of something and if you if you can get endorsements as a comment that's the ultimate yeah um 
uh, you know, obviously, you know, po positive endorsement for your business, but on the contrary, a negative comment is is equally as damaging. So it's so important, obviously, um, for that. I guess um, you have no control about that if they're sort of going about through third party um, uh, services that provide reviews like Trustpilot and, and all those other ones. One of my final questions for you is what about um, a situation where it's a troll, like somebody who's actually not a customer who's, well, they kind of, you know, it's like, it's like an attack on your business where it's a competitor, let's say, who's pretending yeah. to be a customer and write a negative review. And what about happens, a situation like that? Yeah, that happens all the time. I know. Um, recently I saw someone post on their Facebook page that she was having some sort of dispute contractual dispute with someone and she had she was asking her 50,000 followers to leave a one-star review on this person's wow. um, services page so it definitely has been weaponized that's for sure um, so you've got a number of options if the person that's written the comment has left their true identity which often they do um, you can send them a concerns notice accusing them of defamation, mm -hmm. um, provided that what they've said is goes beyond then just their sort of honest opinion. Um, so recently there was a defamation case um, brought by a lawyer against the opponent party who had put a one-star review on the lawyer's page, obviously just out of spite. He wasn't a client and he was found liable for defamation and had to pay a substantial amount of damages. Okay. Um, when you aren't able to identify the person, um, you would normally, every major platform has a complaints policy. Okay. Um, and you would then have to flag the review as either defamatory, untrue, you know, unlawful in some way. Mm. Um, and there are, I mean, there is often success through that, but not always. Mm. Like if you can't prove that that particular person is a customer of yours, like they've, they've created some false identity, right, to, to put that review. Yeah. They're not, if they're a competitor, you know, they're going to put their own. So they created a false identity. And then could you then look in your own database to see, well, this false identity I can't find in my records, so therefore this person is not a customer. Exactly. And, and then you would raise all of that with, let's say it's Google and yeah. ask Google to remove it. Right. Um, as I say, you, there's definitely, there are people that have success with that process, but not consistently. Mm. Um, and your sort of final port of call would be to have to actually go to court to get the records from Google to find out who posted the ad. I haven't seen that happen yet. Yeah. Um, I've seen this. I was just going to say, I've seen this a lot actually in, in the dental space because I used to sort of oh, yes. focus a lot in yes. the dental space. And it's in Australia at, at least, um, it's a super competitive yeah. industry to be in. And, you know, there's no, it's like you, know, you can have a dental practice open up down the road from you. There's sort of no regulation around, um, you know, oversaturation. And there's a lot of fake reviews that are going on because people know that, you know, if, um, there's a couple of one-star reviews. They're not going to go there. So yeah. uh, it's interesting to know that um, if they can, if they've got a leg to stand on to get those really uh, one-star reviews removed because it has a significant effect on businesses. Yeah, I think people are probably becoming a little bit more reluctant to do that because there's been a number of high-profile defamation cases recently. There was one where a woman made a false statement about her plastic surgeon. Right. Um, and I think she was found liable for damages, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the damage she did to his reputation. Wow. Um, so I think people are cautious. You're not, you're not completely anonymous on the internet. Yeah. No one is. And so there is a way to find out ultimately who left that review and people are pursuing it. So I would be yeah. cautious well, about yeah. doing that. That's encouraging for, for business owners like, you know, yeah. yourself and, and myself, you know, that we actually do have a leg to stand on and you can't have these keyboard warriors, you know, who think there are no consequences for their actions, yeah. um, which is really encouraging. Reviews are actually an, an interesting space at the moment because not only are, are there all these issues around, you know, genuine reviews and whether they're 
misleading or deceptive, but actually there's now been a very interesting defamation case just a couple of weeks ago where the High Court has found that media publications are responsible for the defamatory comments by third parties on their website. Interesting. Um, so it's um, definitely going to be an interesting space to watch. Mm. And I'm sure, you know, as um, I, even, even an agency owner who's responsible for many people's marketing, this is an area that you really need to be um, across on and what you can and you can't say and do online because there's a ripple effect of that, especially if you've got, you know, 30 clients and suddenly you're doing the wrong thing for 30 people. Absolutely. You can really land yourself in some hot water. Um I think we might wrap it up there unless there's uh, an, a certain area that we didn't cover over Bridget or have we pretty much covered a lot of the basics that people need to know? I think we've covered some of the basics. It obviously is um, a much broader topic. Mm. Um, maybe we, we have, can um yeah maybe we can invite you back on a more uh, on another episode to go more in depth into into okay. other areas. Definitely. One of the areas that I think that would definitely be worth discussing is influencer marketing. That's yes. another area that's really um, under the regulator's spotlight. Mm. At the moment. I think um, that deserves a whole nother episode in itself. If, you're, if you'd be willing to come back on, I'd love to that's talk to you about that. As I find more and more businesses are using that form of marketing and, and obviously paid influencers, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Bridget, you've been a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I'm sure you've opened uh, our listeners to a, to a world that they are hopefully more aware of now. But if people want to get your advice and, and your help, where can they find out more information about you and, and the help that you provide? Yeah, well, we would absolutely love to help. Um, our website is www.leveluplegal.com.au. Mm -hmm. Um, we offer a free 30-minute consultation as an introductory call to just um, try and hone down on what the issues are. And uh, we also have a number of blog articles dealing with issues like this, which might be helpful as well. Awesome. So you help um, Australian businesses who want to, uh, you know, the legalities, but do you also help overseas businesses? Yeah, as well? we basically okay. help Australian businesses um, and overseas businesses that want to sell in Australia okay. to make sure that they comply with the Australian consumer law or the relevant um, legislation that applies to their industry. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, I can personally endorse your services, Bridget. You're helping me with registering uh, Teach Traffic as a trademark. So you've got my uh, seal of approval. So thank <laughs> you so much for all, all your help with that. And um, thanks for sharing your knowledge on today's show. And thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. It's been fun. Awesome. Thanks, Ilana. Thanks so much for listening to the Teach Traffic podcast. For more information on each of these episodes and handy PDFs that you can download, head on over to teachtraffic.com.